Today is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. To all of us who are here, Merry Christmas. It is still Christmas, uh, and I hope you had a good December 25th. Remember, Christmas continues for us until uh, the 6th of January, which is Epiphany. Uh, we will observe Epiphany on uh, Sunday the 5th, though. So we still got uh, a little bit more than a week of Christmas to go. And uh, that's the great thing about being Reformed theology and about being Presbyterian, is that we get, two, we get actual 12 days of Christmas, not just that one day. Um, let us prepare our hearts and prepare to worship God by meditating on our prayer.
If you so choose, and if you would, please stand and join me in our call to worship this morning from Hebrews 2. We recount the gracious deeds of God, all the praiseworthy acts the Lord has done for us. Praise God for coming to dwell among us, Emmanuel. Praise God for the good news of Jesus, the pioneer of our salvation. Praise God for making us brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise God who is present with us, lifting us up and carrying us. God's glory shines in heaven and on earth. Praise the Lord. And now our prayer of invocation and adoration. Exalted God, even as the heavenly hosts sang of your glory in the night skies over Bethlehem, even as the star shone in the heavens, so we gather, young and old together, to recount all that you have done for us in mercy and steadfast love. No tyrant's threat or deadly act destroy the dreams and visions you have placed within us. For you have drawn us close. With all creation, we praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 28. Good Christian friends rejoice. Number 28. You may be seated. Our announcements are these. As always, we do Sunday school at 10 a.m. with Kurt Lester as our leader and teacher. And uh, I'll say it like I always say, if you're missing it, you're missing out. Uh, December 29th, that's today, uh, the first Sunday after Christmas. Uh, the 12 days start with December 25th and go to Epiphany on January 6th. However, you don't count the Sundays because those are festival worship days already. So that's how we end up with the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, we were going to do a congregational meeting today to elect elders. That will be delayed until next week. It'll be right after the service. Uh, so that's January 5th, which is the second Sunday after Christmas, and that's when we will do the congregational meeting. It is also when we will observe the epiphany of the Lord. The actual date of that is the Monday, which is January 6th, and that is the end of Christmas. Then we go back into ordinary time. So the pyramids will be green again, and I'll continue to call it extraordinary time uh, just because every moment here in this church is extraordinary. Uh, and as always, the storehouse is looking for non-perishable food items to feed our hungry, uh, specifically peanut butter and pasta meals like uh, Chef Boyardee in a can is what they're looking for primarily uh, because they're packed with nutrition more than you'd ever think. And uh, you can leave them here in the narthex, and we will get it to them. Uh, is anybody willing to admit to a birthday? 
Well, yeah, I got you last time. You got me last time. Yep. How about joys? I'll start by saying it's a joy to be here. I know that uh, once we had such a full house on Christmas Eve that everything seemed so empty, but I say it's still full. Uh, it's a joy to be here with you all today. Um, I'm happy to report that Martha is home. Uh, we went to visit her last night. She's doing great. Um, the pain is not nearly as bad as it was, and she's starting physical therapy at home today. Wonderful. That's going to be, uh, she's going to have a lot of fun doing that. Yes. I saw her, where she put on Facebook that she had escaped, and that's nice. Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> Other joys? We had a nice Christmas day with <clears throat> some of my family. Wonderful. I, uh, did anyone have a bad Christmas? I don't know that I ever had one. Even when the one where I was driving from Chicago, Illinois to Logan, West Virginia, or Cow Creek, all in one day, uh, on Christmas Day, but it was worth it. Even that one wasn't bad. My family and I had the privilege of meeting our twins this week. We went to an ultrasound, and mm. so we met, officially met them, one boy, one girl. I won't ask if you could tell which one is the evil twin yet. I'll, I'll save that joke for another time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a blessing too and a joy. How about, uh, oh, other joys? How about the uh, concerns? I'll start uh, with my mother, whose back issues have gotten severe again, and she is going to have to have a spinal surgery, probably sometime in January. Pain relief specifically is what we would ask for. Mildred Fox, I've heard she's been in the hospital and had a spinal or back loss to the back. And also all those of our friends that we know that are ill. And all those families. You have Forty Shrewsbury and Freddie Lester and Burl Moore. And also have And that's Anne without an E. I finally learned. Let's pray for Christ's intercession. God of steadfast love, we thank you in this joyful Christmas tide for all the blessings we enjoy the shelter of home, the comfort of family and friends, the company of the faithful with whom we celebrate Christ's coming here today, and for your love, which shines as a light in the darkness. For these and many other blessings besides, we offer our thanks and praise. God of mercy, in this holy season, there are people in need of your tender mercies. We pray for those who are ill and for those who are recovering, for those who have sadness made heavier by the memories of Christmas past or by present pain. We pray for those who do not have enough, enough food, enough money, enough companionship, enough hope. Because there is not yet peace on earth, we pray for this, and we pray for those in harm's way. For these and many other needs, we offer our prayers. We entrust ourselves and those we love to your care. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Do we have young disciples today? Then I'll save my angel talk with them for later. Um, brothers and sisters, Jesus became like us in every respect. He became a human being so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest 
in service of God. As we confess our sins, we, before, we, we come before the one who was also tested by what he suffered. Confident that he is able to help us, let us now confess, confess our sins now with our corporate prayer and then our silent and personal prayers of confession. If you will join me. Merciful God, in great love, you have claimed us as your children. We confess that we have not loved you as we should. We have not participated fully in your purposes and plans. We grow weary and give up when the way is tough. We have not loved our brothers and sisters as you intend. Help us to praise you by living in harmony and peace. Do not be ashamed of us, we pray, but strengthen us in our time of testing. Set us free from fear that we may wholly trust in you. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who showered our flesh and blood. And let all God's children say, Amen. Children of God, it is clear that Jesus Christ came to help sinners. He is our Savior in all our distress and it is his presence that saves us. Declare with me the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Peace be unto you. Let's make a joyful noise with hymn number 31, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Not Mark and Herald the Angels Sing, but Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 31.
once again, you may be seated. Of course, I don't need to tell you that, do I? If you would join me in our prayer for illumination. Holy God, speak your word. Let those who hear guard the good treasure entrusted to them with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us all. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and he said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are now dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he, had, when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there, and after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Friends, the word of the Lord. Now this is kind of a rough part of scripture, ain't it? Christmas is supposed to be about peace and joy, and here we are reading about the slaughter of innocent children. And the Holy Family being forced into being refugees and fleeing to Egypt. In fact, this passage from Scripture is so unpleasant and goes against the grain of what we feel Christmas is so much. Most of the time we end up just skipping over this. Of course, I don't do that and uh, much to your all chagrin, I don't tend to skip many things. The problem with skipping it is the same problem with skipping over any part of Scripture. There is a reason or there are reasons this was included. Now, I found one good reason Matthew included this in his gospel. I'm sure there are many more than one, but I found one that I want to talk about today. Yes, Christmas is about peace on earth and goodwill toward all people. But there is a war on Christmas. Christmas does bring with it a conflict. Now, let's be clear about this. When I say there's a war on Christmas, I'm absolutely not... Absolutely not talking about people saying happy holidays or calling something a holiday party instead of a Christmas party or Starbucks using a plain red cup instead of having a Christmas tree on it or something. That is not the war on Christmas. If that's what you think the war on Christmas is, it just simply doesn't exist. None of that is a war on Christmas. The kind of war on Christmas isn't real. Look, it's like this. If you are offended or upset by someone saying happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas, or conversely, if someone wishing you a Merry Christmas instead of happy holidays offends you or upsets you, I don't know what to tell you. I just don't know what to tell you. I don't want to invalidate anyone's feelings, but I think you might be assigning meaning and importance to something that has no meaning or importance at all. I mean, if you are trying to force someone by law to not say Merry Christmas or to not say Happy Holidays, that might be something to worry about. Otherwise, that war on Christmas isn't real. And I don't know what to tell you if that bothers you. I do know what to tell you about the real war on Christmas, though. There is really one. It actually does exist, and we see it start right here in the Gospel according to Matthew. First thing I want to do, though, is address a part of this that comes up a lot in discussions amongst muckety-muck theologians 
and biblical scholars, of which I am not. We have no historical record of Herod's slaughter of the innocents outside of the Bible. There's no documentation for it. A lot of people say that means it didn't happen, that Matthew just made it up. So let me tell you a few things about King Herod. It is from the historical record outside the Bible. Herod was a paranoid psychopath who killed hundreds, maybe thousands of people. He killed half of the Sanhedrin. If you'll remember, the Sanhedrin was that 70-member high priest sort of supreme court of the temple in Jerusalem. It's the same group of high priests who illegally put Jesus on trial. Herod had 35 of them killed because of some minor political trouble that he felt they were giving him. This is the Sanhedrin. These are high priests. Herod just had him killed. He had scores of noblemen and other elites killed because he suspected, suspected they might be against him. They had done nothing. He also killed his own wife because he decided he couldn't trust her anymore. Herod killed two of his own sons because he thought there was a small chance they would try to take his throne. He was a paranoid psychopath. Do you think with all that high-profile killing, and we're not even talking about the killing he did to be king or to stay king, that was a real thing. We're just talking about his paranoia here. Do you think with all this high-profile killing that Herod sending soldiers to kill 20 or 30 peasant children would be something that made front page news? It all comes from Herod's paranoia. The wise men came to him and said, show us the one that was born king. And that was all it took. It was all it took. Herod took it as a challenge to his throne that someone else that was born king, that anyone would even say that someone else was king. So he ordered the killing of all males two years and younger in and around Bethlehem. Probably, if you go by population numbers, 20 to 30 children. It was this claim to kingship that went with Christ that started the real war on Christmas. It's this claim of being the Lord that continues the war on Christmas all the way to today. It is more than Herod or Caesar or other kings fighting against Jesus having authority above them. It is a rejection of Christ's lordship his kingship from all people in all times. Look at the persecution of Christians throughout all of history. It still continues today. Now, we don't see much real persecution here in our country. Before you ask, no, someone not saying Merry Christmas and saying Happy Holidays is not persecution. People not allowing us as Christians to force them to do and say what we want them to do is not persecution either. If anything, Christians are the ones who do the most persecuting in this country. Christians in this country do face quite a bit of ridicule and disrespect and insults, but not much in the way of actual persecution. However, Christians in other places in this world still face and are mired in all kinds of persecution. ISIS on Christmas Day killed 11 Nigerian Christians. Still going on today, this war on Christmas. That part of the war on Christmas is still going on, and it's awful, and it seems like it will always be there until Jesus comes back. But there's another facet, or another part of this war on Christmas, this real war on Christmas, that all of us, really all Christians, do face. And unfortunately... We are the ones being attacked in this war. And here's the worst part. We're also the ones doing the attacking in this war. All of us. And it's for the same reason that it's always been there. It's the reason for the persecution and violence. It's the reason Herod had and Caesar had and the Romans. We want to reject the lordship of Jesus. We want to reject his kingship. We are opposed to the authority of Christ. And we don't have any problem with the salvation he brings and the rescue he brings. We love that. I mean, we want that, right? We want it so very much, and for the most part, we really do appreciate it. Thanks, Jesus. 
for that salvation and rescue. We don't deserve it. We worship Christ for this easily and readily when it comes to the salvation he brings, the sacrifice he made for us, the merit and the righteousness he gives to us that we can't possibly earn. We love him, we worship him, we adore him for this. But when it comes to the authority of Christ, well, not so much. We're not big fans of that part. We want to retain control of our lives. We want to decide what is right for us, not have somebody else tell us. We want to do the things we want to do, and we don't want to do the things we don't want to do. We also want to keep the fake identities we've built for ourselves instead of an identity as a servant of Christ and a child of God. Please and thank you for the salvation and rescue, Jesus. But we don't really want to forgive anybody. Come on. That means we have to give up revenge and grudges. And that stuff is oh so sweet. I mean, we know you're God. And we know that you paid the ultimate price so we don't have to. But we really don't want to be generous to people. And we certainly don't want to give things to people who we think don't deserve it. Come on, they just don't want to work. And they're not going to appreciate it anyway. We're grateful and quite happy to accept being saved by you, Jesus. But we're also very happy to tell people we are your disciples and servants. I mean, we like to claim that identity publicly. But what we really want to hold on to is the identity we have built for ourselves. Like I'm a success, or I'm smart, or I'm pretty, or I'm rich, or I'm popular. Everybody loves me. I'm a great dad. I'm a great mom. I'm a big deal. That's the identity we want to hang on to. Also, we really don't want to do what you did and tend to the poor and sick and the widows and the orphans. We have our own desires we want to serve. we got things we want to do and things we want for ourselves. And serving all those other people is inconvenient. And a lot of times those people are super annoying. And they certainly aren't grateful enough. So thanks very much, Jesus, for suffering and dying and having all of our sins placed on you. Thanks very much for eternal life, but we really don't want any of that lordship stuff. I mean, we'll call you the king and all that, but we don't really want to follow you like we would a king. Because it means we have to do what you tell us to do, and we would rather do what we want to do. So yes, there is a war on Christmas, and it's a big part of it, a large part of it, is us. The very people who claim Christ as Lord reject him as Lord. The war on Christmas is us so very often. So that leaves us with one last question then. If Christmas is about peace and joy, or is it about conflict and war? The good news, a piece of the good news is it is still very much about peace and joy. The peace and joy that comes from the salvation and rescue Jesus gives us, of course. The peace and joy that comes from being free from the burdens of those fake identities and all the pressure it puts on us when our identity is firmly rooted in our adoption into God's family of Jesus Christ being the king, we're free from those burdens and that pressure. The peace and joy that comes from knowing that no matter what terrible thing befalls us, in the end we will see nothing but joy and glory in heaven. So yes, Christmas is about peace and joy. But there is a war on Christmas, and we still play a major role in it when we do the things we do and reject the lordship of Christ. When we give ourselves over to Christ, the war is won, and it's joy to the world. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for the peace that comes from you. We also give thanks for your steadfast support when it comes to the conflicts. We know that you are the light in every darkness. Shine then upon anyone who is troubled. Shine then upon the troubles we have known. Help us to put our trust in you. For we are your children, and Christ is our King. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All creation teems with the abundance of God's provision. Our own lives bear witness to the abundance of God's love and mercy. For God has lifted us up and carried us in our need. In joyful praise we offer to God a portion of all that we have received. Let us pray. In this gifting season, O God, we are grateful for the gift of your dear Son, our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. Receive, we pray, these offerings we bring. May they be used in the service of your grace and truth dwelling among us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let's sing hymn number 29, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Number 29.
us confirm what we believe with the Apostles' Creed. If you will join me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go out to share the good news with a world bent low from suffering and fear. Jesus Christ has come to help us and to set us free. May the God, the Creator, God, Christ, the Savior, and God, the Holy Spirit, our Advocate, guard your going out and your coming in, and be your strength and help in every time of need. Hallelujah. Amen. First verse of joy to the world is benediction response, page 40. <clears throat> At least the last one, now three years, mm -hmm. has been that way, and it's like that at Logan, too. Yeah, I think it's universal. Well, everybody's tired, sick of traveling, and uh, uh, they've already done an extra service, so uh, it's a... Uh, <clears throat> I'm, sure, I'm not sure what to think about it, but I, I always err on the side of understanding. Thank you, thank you.